Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie King with the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, and I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, to uh, get a look at the work that we have been doing to build new assessments, in particular in mathematics, uh, to measure students' college readiness. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Shelby Cole, who is our Director of Mathematics. Um, Shelby's going to be walking you through uh, a new online tool that we have to uh, look at sample items. Um, but before we get to the, the actual items, I thought that it would probably be useful to give you a little more background on what Smarter Balanced is and how we are engaging with higher education. Um, so we'll do that for a few minutes, and then I'll be turning to Shelby, who will be um, really digging into the, the fun stuff, the actual sample items. Um, as you look at the one little housekeeping note, as you look at the uh, screen, um, you'll see a little box in the bottom right-hand corner called chat. Um, that is the mechanism whereby you can ask questions this afternoon. So if you have any questions, um, please refer them to me, Jackie King. I'm, I'm on the list, um, and I'll be looking at them um, as we go and trying to answer questions as they come up. Um, if you have any technical problems, also joining us on the call is Amy Allers from WestEd, who is our project management partner. So if you're experiencing any connectivity or other technical problems or, or challenges figuring out the software, please send those notes to Amy, and she'll try to, try to assist you. So with that, we will get into a, a short introduction to what is this thing with the funny name called Smarter Balanced. Um, so if you'll move to the next slide, that's great. So it is, it is, uh, it is not just a buttery spread. Um, Smarter Balanced is one of two consortia of states um, that are working to build next generation uh, assessments uh, tied to the Common Core state standards in English language arts literacy and mathematics. Uh, we were funded primarily through a grant from the federal government that was part of the Race to the Top, assess, uh, Race to the Top program. This was uh, money, you'll recall, that came through the Stimulus Act. Um, and we also have some funding from private foundations. Um, we are a state-led consortium. We're, we're governed by our member states. Um, both K-12 and higher education representatives, and we use a, a consensus model. So we try to achieve um, agreement among our, our member states on um, all key policy matters. Um, next slide will give you a look at the states that are in the consortium. The states in green are our governing states. Those are the states that um, have committed to using the Smarter Balanced Assessment. Um, in their K-12 public schools. The blue states are advisory states. They are um, working with us and participating in the consortium, but they yet, haven't yet made a firm commitment. Uh, and we'll move on to the next one. So why do we have higher education involved? I mentioned that we, uh, we have uh, folks representing your states from both K-12 and higher education in the consortium? Um, well, for a couple of reasons. The Common Core State Standards, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, were written um, really to work backwards from expectations for college readiness. So a lot of the work was done uh, to ascertain the uh, expectations of college faculty, um, to look at what standards are around the world, um, and then to map backwards from there to the individual grade levels. But the, the goal um, really was for students to complete high school ready to go on to post-secondary education and to be successful in credit-bearing courses. And this was really built into uh, the program that gave us our funding. Um, so when uh, the consortia applied for the federal grant, um, higher education in the, our member states agreed to participate in the design of the assessments with the goal that colleges and universities would recognize the 11th grade summative assessment as evidence that students were ready for entry-level credit-bearing courses. 
Um, so this is a really important aspect of these assessments and something in most states that's brand new for both K-12 and higher education, that a K-12, otherwise K-12 accountability test would also be used to give students uh, a real stake in uh, how their K-12 education ties into their future in post-secondary education. So this is a great opportunity for colleges and universities to work with their colleagues in K-12 to improve college readiness, uh, reduce the need for remediation. Um, the test is in the 11th grade so that if students are not college ready, uh, colleges and schools can work together to design interventions to help them uh, address any academic deficiencies, hopefully while they're still in high school. So it should lead to reduced remediation and ultimately improved college completion. If you go on to the next slide. Um, so a little bit more about um, how we see the Common Core Standards and the Smarter Balanced Assessments being essential components of the completion agenda for higher education. We know that the rigor of students' academic preparation is the most powerful predictor of student success in college. Um, the Common Core State Standards uh, are an attempt to anchor the K-12 experience in the real-world expectations uh, for success in, in college and in the workplace. Um, right now, students and teachers are guessing about what your expectations are in higher education, and we want to try to remove that guesswork and, and allow schools and parents and students to track their progress across the grades. Um, as I've already mentioned, we think a great benefit is going to be identifying students who need assistance in the middle school grades and while they're still in high school so that we can address deficiencies before students get to college. Going on to the next slide. I want to note that the assessments are just one part of a broader Common Core Standards implementation agenda for higher education. Um, the first one thing that comes to most people's mind when we think about Common Core and higher ed is understandably teacher preparation and school leader preparation and professional development, and that's absolutely an important piece. And I think there may be some of you on the call who are in um, math education. Um, I think you'll be interested to look at the sample items from the perspective of how this might change. Um, how these new kinds of expectations might change the work that you do in preparing teachers. Um, the assessments uh, are a really important part of setting uh, clear expectations. Um, in addition to uh, the assessments, other ways that can be done is through course requirements um, and, and the like. Um, ultimately, we think that, that the Common Core Standards will um, prompt higher education to look at their own curricula. As students go through these new, are educated under these new standards, leave high school with a different kind of preparation, it will be probably necessary for a lot of colleges and universities to take a look at their first year courses and hopefully be able to jettison some of the, the material that you might have been covering because you didn't feel like it was adequately covered in high school. I think most college faculty would applaud that, and we hope that will that will happen. Um, in addition, probably important to look at adult and developmental curricula as well as the first year general education. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, there's some great work going on around the country with high schools and colleges uh, collaborating to design intervention programs, uh, special transition courses, and other types of programs so that students can uh, remedy any academic deficiencies while they're still in high school. Also a great chance for those students who are college ready at the end of the 11th grade to think about dual enrollment and more accelerated opportunities uh, during their senior year. And last but not least, there's going to be an enormous need for new curricular materials that have high fidelity to the standards and college and university faculty will play an important role there as well. So the assessments are just one piece of a broader agenda. Um, so this is our vision for, for 
assessing readiness and and how we think Smarter Balance can really help bring uh, a lot more clarity and transparency to the process. If we think about the way uh, readiness and placement testing happen on most of our college campuses today, each college or sometimes college or university system sets its own standards and selects its own measures. Uh, K-12 doesn't know what those standards are. They don't know about the measures. Um, students don't know about placement tests in general, and they don't typically prepare for them. Um, so it's a surprise to most students when they arrive on campuses and are told that they need to take a placement test. Um, some institutions do a great job of, of testing the predictive validity of their placement tests and, and setting those cut scores through a rigorous empirical process, um, but that is not a, a universal practice. Um, and in many places, there have not been uh, studies of predictive validity. So the tests are being used, but really how well they, um, they classify students um, who absolutely need remediation from those who do not um, is unknown in a lot of cases. And students um, can take the courses that they are told they should take, pass them, um, and be admitted uh, to college and then find out at the very end of the road that they need remediation. Um, where we hope that Smarter Balance can help take things is that our assessments are designed around known and agreed upon standards, the common core. You'll, you know what they are, K-12 teachers know what they are, um, everyone has access to them and understands the standards. Our proficiency standards, our cut scores, if you will, are going to be set through an open process with substantial higher education involvement. And um, if folks are interested, we can, we can talk some more about how that will happen. Um, so everyone will know what the expectations are. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, to give you a little bit more information on the Smarter Balanced Assessment System, it really is a, a three-part system. We'll be talking primarily today about the summative assessments. Those are the end-of-year um, assessments uh, that will be used for school accountability purposes and in grade 11 for um, evidence of students' readiness for college. Um, but that's only one piece of the system. Um, we are also building interim assessments. Um, that will draw from a similar kind of item bank, but will be open, non-secured, and flexible. So teachers can use them to design customized assessments throughout the year. So if a student is, if a teacher is, for example, doing a unit on, uh, on fractions in the seventh grade, they can pull items um, related to the, state, the Common Core Standards on fractions for the seventh grade and, and create their own assessments that way. And then we're also building a bank of resources for teachers to use to do formative assessment. Um, and that's a really important aspect of the system um, with just as much emphasis on, on formative assessment as hopefully on the end of year summative. Um, so we'll talk mostly today about summative, but I wanted you to, under to know that, that this is a system that really tries to balance um, both formative and summative assessment. And we can go to the next slide. So drilling down a little bit more on the summative assessment, its purposes, purpose, benefits, and limitations. Um, thinking about the purpose, it, it, it does, uh, the summative assessment does fulfill the traditional purpose of these tests in K-12 education, which is accountability at the state level, the district level, the school level, and in some states at the classroom or teacher level. Um, but in addition to that, it also has this uh, somewhat unique purpose for, for K-12 of providing information about readiness for college and about students' achievement and growth over time towards that readiness um, uh, for college. Oh, there's a question here that came in to Amy that she's passed on to me about uh, the cost of the assessment. So the assessments are free to students. But there will be a cost to states to administer the assessments. The federal grant that we have um, is paying for the development. 
And essentially by pooling our expertise and taking advantage of this infusion of federal dollars to support the, the R&D work, we're able to build an assessment system that is much more rigorous and sophisticated than what individual states have typically been able to do on their own. And I think when Shelby starts showing you uh, the sample items, you'll get a really good sense of that. Um, but it will not be 100% free to states. There will be costs to admit for administration to the states. Um, in most cases, those costs will be lower than what they've paid currently because the development costs are being taken care of and there are some economies of scale because of the large group of students that will be taking the test. But it is certainly not 100% free. It is, of course, free to the, to the individual student. Um, so, uh, so there's this sort of dual purpose, looking at individual students and thinking about groups of students collectively for purposes of accountability. Um, as I've mentioned, this is going to give us a much more sophisticated and comprehensive measure of student knowledge and skills um, than most uh, K-12 uh, or, or college or commercial college placement exams currently um, can do. Um, uh, and I've talked about a lot of those benefits. Some of the limitations. Um, the summative exam is not diagnostic in nature. We do, for, for K-12 teachers, have the interim and the formative assessment tools that do provide diagnostic information. But this test given at the end of the academic year um, is, not, uh, is not diagnostic in nature. So I have gotten the question from some higher ed audiences, well, could we, you know, could we use this if we're if we're thinking about uh, oh for example a self placed self paced developmental math module, could we use this to know pinpoint what are the student you know just what the students need in in that mo in that kind of self paced uh, course and what they don't need and it's the the final summative assessment is really not designed for that um, uh, so um, it you know. So it may be that in some cases there's a need for students to take additional assessments when they get to college, um, either if they're not yet college ready to figure out what level of remediation they need, or if they're college ready but they want to go on to perhaps a more advanced course. If these students are coming in wanting to take calculus. You may colleges may want to administer a placement exam to know whether or not they're um, they're ready for that, and that's absolutely understood as part of this system, but the student would know at least that they don't need remediation and that they can proceed into an entry-level, credit-bearing, uh, transferable course. Um, the other thing that's important for this group to know is that uh, we will not be measuring readiness for advanced mathematics. Um, those standards are in the Common Core. Um, if you look at the Common Core state standards, they've got a little plus symbol by them. Um, they do exist. In most cases, the assumption is, is that instruction would happen in grade 12, and since we're testing students at the end of grade 11, um, we're not including that content. I certainly hope that we can in the future. Um, the, test that we are, the test that we are building, which will be first administered in uh, schools in the 2014-15 academic year are really Smarter Balanced 1.0, and we certainly hope for uh, Smarter Balanced 2.0 that uh, that we could um, test those those more advanced mathematics skills. Um, and this school states might have to test those at the end of 12th grade in, instead of the end of 11th grade, depending on uh, the instructional model, but. Um, it really would be great to do that at some point in the future. Um, another question that came in over chat was, would there be an opportunity for 11th graders who do not meet the cutoff to retake the test in grade 12? Uh, some states are certainly thinking about that, and that um, there will be additional cost to that, so it, it is a state decision, but we think it's a great option. Um, it's also a wonderful thing if, um, if, this, if the state is working on some kind of um, transition pro transition courses or other types of um, 
of intervention for students in grade 12. It would really be great to be able to re-administer the Smarter Balanced exam in grade 12 and look at, you know, to look at growth and look at the um, uh, effectiveness of those programs. So that, that'll be a state-by-state -state decision, but yes, our model, um, we're building a very, very large item bank um, for reasons that I'll, I'll get to, and it, it will support um, some retaking of the test in, in grade 12. Um, another question that came in was asking about the difference between formative and interim assessment. So the interim assessment, those will be our designed, tested items in our item bank, and um, they can be used in one of two ways. As I've mentioned, um, uh, there will be the opportunity for teachers or schools to create customized assessments built around specific standards. It's also going to be possible for schools to do essentially a, a, what we call a clone of the summative assessment using the non-secured interim items. So if a, if a district, for example, halfway through the school year wants to kind of get a read of how well students are progressing towards meeting the proficiency standards, they could administer that clone of the summative assessment and it and it um, it will be reported on the same scale and they'll get a good sense of, of where they are. The bank of formative tools is much broader and really is an opportunity for educators to pool resources about lots of different kinds of, of formative assessment practices. Um, these aren't just test items. These are uh, a wide array of uh, different kinds of activities um, that teachers have used to do formative assessment. And I think we're even planning, it'll have sort of that Amazon function, so you can um, uh, you can um, teachers could go in and say you know I tried this and I like this part about this this um, assessment a lot but I didn't like this and so I've tried that and so there'll be an opportunity for teachers to really use this to to get um, to share information about for, uh, formative assessment practices that that work well for them. Um, another piece of that tool will be some professional development materials to help teachers better understand how to do formative assessment, how to interpret results. Um, so it also will have a professional development uh, component. Um, let's see, other questions that have come in before we move on. Uh, question has come in, and, sh and Shelby, maybe I'll kick this one to you if you don't mind. A question has come in asking that if schools teach algebra in the eighth grade, can, uh, how will that work with the assessment, given that the assessments are, are at the, the grade level? Um, well, there's a couple of different answers. The first is that um, the only place in the Common Core State Standards where you see where you see a little bit of overlap is is in the grade eight and um, high school standards. So you do see a pretty close link between some of the stuff students are doing in eighth grade and some of the stuff that would be considered algebra one. Um, the other thing that we're doing is to tag the grade, we're tagging the high school items by grade. So um, anything that would show up in grade nine um, algebra one essentially would be tagged as a grade nine item versus a high school item so that down the road we will have the flexibility to say that um, a subset of the high school items could be opened up to the the grade eight assessment if if we decide to go in that direction and, and that's not a decision that's been explicitly made but we have decided to tag our items in such a way to make it possible in the future and I think this will be a little bit clearer, too, as we start to talk a little bit more about the, the summative assessment. Um, let's see. Will the formative assessment tool be open to the public? Uh, yes, it will be. Um, will they be juried um, by Smarter Balanced? And I don't know the answer to that question. Will the formative tools be juried by Smarter Balanced? Um, I believe so, and that's a great question. I think that's one we're going to have to um, uh, peg and 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 get back to you on. So if whoever put in that question, um, um, if you could send a note to 
to Amy with your email address. We'll try to get that answer to you. Um, so, so, and then there's a question about scoring that I think will also make sense in a moment. So let's move. Let's move on. Um, and I think some of the the questions that folks are putting in are going to make a little more sense in a minute. So the summit of assessment has two major components to it: a computer adaptive uh, test and performance tasks. Um, so. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with computer adaptive testing, but just to kind of give you a broad brush on this, the notion with computer adaptive testing is that uh, you can more accurately and more efficiently pinpoint students' performance level by customizing the, the, the test to the student. So as students answer questions, they, uh, they will get either slightly more difficult questions or slightly less difficult questions based on their previous answers. So I think of it as a game of the old childhood game of you're getting warm, you're getting cold, um, and that the computer is able to do that through, um, through a, a fairly complicated algorithm um, to get at, it's a way of getting at the full range of, of the standards, but also really getting a clear sense of, of students' abilities. It's particularly valuable for students at the high end of the spectrum and the low end of the spectrum. On a fixed form test, uh, the, the advanced student would may, you know, zip through all the items and be done. And you really, you know they can do those items, but you don't know what else they can do. Um, the, conversely, the, the struggling student may not be able to answer almost anything. And so you really don't know anything about what that student can do and where their level really is. And computer adaptive testing allows you um, to test uh, the full range of student uh, uh, knowledge and skills. Um, it's also the case, as Shelby has al alluded to, that um, if we've got a student who is, you know, really an advanced eighth grade student and they're just Knock, you know, they're just knocking all those eighth grade items out of the park, the adaptive engine will have the capacity to reach into the ninth grade item pool if necessary, and conversely to reach down um, if necessary for students um, um, who are struggling with the grade level items. Um, we'll be able to measure both current student achievement and student growth over time. Um, and we'll have a lot of different question types, which you'll see more as, as Shelby shows you the, the sample items. Um, uh, along with the computer adaptive portion, there will also be performance tasks, and we'll show you some of those today. And these are extended projects uh, that allow students to demonstrate um, uh, real-world writing and analytical school skills. They can include online research, group projects, presentations. These will usually extend over uh, one or two class periods. Um, and they are both in the English language arts and mathematics assessments. These are, are really helpful um, in mathematics when we think about the standards for communicating reasoning and the like um, to be able to get at, at some of those um, more complex skills that are, are hard to measure um, with with more traditional assessment approaches. Um, so the assessment will contain both elements. Um, so, so the computer adaptive portion, somebody asked a question about scoring of the interim assessments. So for those things that can be computer scored, can be machine scored, they would be automatic, the, the computer would do that. Um, and for those things that would need to be human scored, the rubrics would be made available, would be available, and teachers could score those. Um, so I'll keep going here. So a little bit more on our goals for higher education. So a key component, of course, is that colleges and universities recognize the Smarter Balance Grade 11 assessment as a valid measure of college, what we're saying, content readiness. And somebody asked a question about affective measurements. We really, our charge here is to measure student mastery of the Common Core State Standards. We recognize that there are 
many other elements that go into whether or not a student is college ready. Um, there's understanding of other content areas beyond English and math, and there's a whole array of, of attributes and habits of mind um, that impacts a student's readiness to move on to college. Um, so we are, are truth in advertising. We're using the term content readiness to just signal that we recognize that there's a lot more to college readiness than just English and math. But English and math, as defined in the Common Core, are, is what we're measuring with these assessments. Um, so what this means, um, which is a big, big change for higher education, is that within our consortium, college and universities would agree on a, to accept a common performance standard, English language arts and mathematics, for college content readiness. And as we, we think back to that a slide about the vision and how we do this currently, in many cases, you know, individual campus by individual campus, this is a this is a big a big change. Now there it, it's not the only piece of evidence that colleges can use. We're not suggesting that colleges don't use multiple measures. Using multiple measures is absolutely a best practice, and we support that. Um, but with regard to the assessment, students um, who score on the assessment would know that. Uh, contingent on their subsequent performance in grade 12, that they're ready for credit-bearing courses, students who score at that college-ready level, um, and that they won't have to take remedial coursework. OK, so next. So having higher ed involved is really, really important to the success of this entire endeavor. And we've been working um, along a lot of different avenues to um, engage higher education in this work. Um, the, definitions, the definitions of college and career readiness have been something that we've been vetting through our, our lead higher education people for the states, as well as through um, faculty. We just had a week-long workshop um, uh, where faculty and high school teachers came together um, working over uh, the course of several days on our, both our definition of college readiness and our detailed descriptions of uh, what are the various achievement levels on the test will mean. What does it mean if a student is proficient uh, in mathematical reasoning in, at grade 11? What does that signal? So that's a document that is in uh, that they this, this committee worked on, and that we're now sort of cleaning up and getting ready to to uh, to send out, um, and that will be available for public comment and review um, shortly after Thanksgiving and through the middle of January. So encourage you um, to look for that and to provide us with your thoughts and comments on that once it, once it becomes available. Um, OK. Another question, this is a question we get all the time, what about retention of content? Absolutely. So clearly, the question of what happens in grade 12, very, very important. Also, we know that we're going to need to set a policy about how long the, score, uh, the scores are considered valid. And we haven't addressed that yet, but we know we need to, and we'll be doing that. Um, that'll be something that higher ed will have a lot of input on, um, because we recognize that, of course, students forget things, and we, um, and uh, and so we're going to need to make some decisions about um, how long we would recommend that colleges consider the scores valid. Um, so having higher ed involved will influence. The definition, uh, it, it, it has been and will continue to influence changes in high school curricula and teaching. Um, higher ed's having a lot to say about the structure and content of the assessments um, and these, these 12th grade interventions. Um, a, a question has come in about um, subscores. 
um, and how that will work and what kind of subscores we will be providing. Um, Shelby, do you want to say a little bit about the, the subscores um, that we'll be providing in mathematics? Sure. Um, in terms of the summative assessment, um, there were a lot of conversations about what scores should be reported. Um, and for the summative, we decided to report only at, at most four claims and potentially um, two of those claims would get combined. So when I say claims, the four math mathematics claims, um, the first one is concepts and procedures, um, which is students' ability to apply procedures and explain why concepts work in mathematics. The second is problem solving, which really focuses on um, problems that do have multiple approaches uh, in order to solve them. Um, the third claim is communicating reasoning which uh, students are asked to look at flawed reasoning, identify flawed reasoning, and, and make corrections as, as necessary or support their own reasoning. And the fourth is uh, modeling and data analysis, um, which, which has slightly less structured problems than claim two and also incorporates the aspect of data analysis as it becomes more critical toward high school. Um, the, the two that we, we are still debating that we may combine our, our claims two and four, and part of that has to do with, with the overlap between those two, and the other part of it has to do with um, how that content progresses from across grades and how modeling becomes more sophisticated toward high school. So it, it may be possible that we can report them separately in later grades, but it maybe doesn't make as much sense in the early grades where modeling is, is quite a bit less sophisticated than you'd see it at the upper grades. Um, and like I said, these were long conversations. A lot of people wanted to see um, algebra reported, geometry reported, and um, there were a few reasons why we decided not to report out by domain. One had to do with um, the fact that we've always done it would potentially lead to having assessments that look exactly like the ones we currently administer. And so any step we can take to make sure that we do make a change, we, we try to go in that direction. But the other reason had to do with um, with this idea of connections across domains. And um, you, you get cases in certain grades where because the connections and the standards are, are so strong inten intentionally that they do tie the stuff in measurement and data, for example, to the stuff that students are doing in operations and algebraic thinking, um, it it's a li becomes a little difficult to interpret a score in one domain um, because it's really confounded by the work in the other. So, so that was the other issue that, that caused us not to go down the, the path of, of domain reporting. Thank you, Shelby. Um, so a question also came in about is a thought about how students can have a stake in the results of these tests. And that's obviously a, then something that's really dogged K-12 testing and these kind of accountability tests. The younger kids may, may make their best effort just because the teacher asked them to. But when we start to think about teenagers, um, it's, they're going to ask the question, well, what's in this for me? And having this connection to what will happen to them in college is a big part of that. What's in it for them? If they know that if they try hard and perform well on these assessments, that they uh, can expect that the public institutions in their states, and in some states they're working with the privates too, um, but, but it's at minimum the public institutions in their state will exempt them from remediation, and they will know that they are ready for uh, credit-bearing coursework especially now as so many students are so worried about the cost of higher education. That's a really powerful piece. You are not going to spend money. You're not going to have to spend money to, to repeat material that you didn't learn in high school. You're going to move on, and you're going to be uh, better positioned to finish college, to finish college expeditiously. That's going to mean a lot to, um, to students and especially, of course, to their parents. So we think that provides... Um, a much greater stake in the outcomes of these assessments for um, for high school students than they've ever had before. Um, so moving moving ahead, because I want to get you to the main event, which is the item. Um, so what we're ho expecting and hoping of higher education is participation in the assessment design, a lead role in defining college content readiness and standard setting for grade 11, and that's already work that's underway and agreement on the performance standard for exemption from remediation in English and math. Import, just as important is what do we not expect. 
Uh, we don't expect colleges to abandon the use of the standard admissions test um, and to start relying on the Smarter Balanced Assessment for admission. This test is not designed to serve the same purpose as an admission test. Um, and we expect that most states will continue with their existing um, admission procedures. Um, we're not expecting any kind of standardization of admission criteria or standards. Um, this is about, for your admitted students, what courses can they take? Um, we're also not expecting standardization of curricula uh, at either the K-12 or the higher education level. As content standards do not equate to curricula. Um, common Core hopefully will provide a common foundation upon which colleges then can build their own curricular paths. Um, but there's no expectation of um, standardization. Um, and as I've, I've alluded to, um, we don't expect uh, colleges to completely rely on Smarter Balanced for placement decisions. Um, you, you colleges very may, well may want to um, look at other data points, either other assessment results or um, very likely um, grades and course taking patterns. So, moving on. And this is my last slide, and then we'll, Shelby will get you into the good stuff. Um, so just give you, to give you a sense of the timeline, this is, a, as you can imagine, this is a massive research and development project that we're undertaking. Um, just to give you a, a high-level overview of some of the key dates for higher education. Um, this past fall, and this past September, most states, um, uh, most states completed uh, implementation plans for higher education. The higher ed leads worked on this with committees in their states and with their state leadership. Um, so states are beginning to begin work on, um, on implementing those, and that has to do with outreach and communication, um, making sure that faculty are well aware of, com of the Common Core State Standards and of Smarter Balanced, and movement towards thinking about this common, um, a common standard for uh, exemption from remediation and, and placement into credit-bearing courses. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, had a, a workshop uh, to draft our, uh, to work on continuing to draft our college content readiness policy and our preliminary achievement level descriptors. Um, then in November, that draft is going to be available for review and comment to the general public. Um, we're going to be having regional leadership meetings for um, chief state school officers, state higher ed executive officers, and governors education policy advisors to talk about this at sort of the state leadership level. And then there will be a vote of our member states um, in March on these uh, preliminary achievement level descriptors um, with the expectation that, um, uh, that K-12 and higher ed will be um, coming up with a consensus position as, as for their state. Um, uh, it's not on here, but also this spring will be pilot testing, selected pilot testing. And then in the spring of 2014, there will be a full-scale field test of the system. And in the summer of 2014, um, based on the data from that field testing, we will do uh, standard setting, the establishment of the, the actual scores that align to those achievement level, those text achievement level descriptors that we're working on now. So that will be a really important um, next, a really important element for higher ed. 2014-15 uh, is the first year of operational testing, and those, those 11th graders who test in the spring of 2015 will be college freshmen in the fall of 2016. Uh, so that's uh, the timeline moving forward. Um, there's a question here about, are Smarter Balance results going to provide areas of remediation? Um, I mentioned before how the tests are not diagnostic. There'll be, you know, there will be these differential scores, as Shelby's explained, which will provide some clues. Um, but we think that the formative and the interim testing is going to be what's going to provide more sort of, you know, meat for teachers in terms of where where are the deficiencies that students need to um, need to address. Um, let's see. There's a question about 
implication for states that are not members. So there are two consortia. Um, Smarter Balance, the other consortia is called PARC. Um, between us, we um, most of the states are members of one of the two consortia. There are a few states that have either did not adopt the Common Core or who are going to uh, do their own thing with regard to assessment. Um, and we are talking to PARC, and we actually were talking to PARC this morning about efforts to make sure that there is comparability between our scores. So, um, for example, um, New Jersey is a park state and Delaware is a smarter balance state. So if a student graduates from high school in Delaware and goes to college in New Jersey, colleges in New Jersey will be able to look at that smarter balance score, compare it to the park score, and have confidence that um, there's a level of comparability there that they can rely on so that they could also exempt those students from, uh, from remediation. So um, there's a lot of work, uh, collaborative work being done between the, the two consortia as well. Um, okay, and with that, I want to I wanna pass things off uh, to Shelby to, to start to get you into the meat of the, uh, the sample items and tasks. I'm going to go back through all of the questions to make sure that I've addressed them, and if there are any that I haven't, we'll be sure to try to, to get to those um, uh, at the conclusion of the webinar. So thank you, everybody, and I'll turn it over to Shelby. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so before I get started, let me just give a little bit of background because I suspect that most people on the on the call don't know who I am. Um, so I was a high school math teacher and then worked on a national research study uh, at the University of Connecticut where we were developing and implementing curriculum across 15 states um, as well as assessments to um, study you know, the effects of differentiated curriculum. This particular study was at grade three. Um, and so the, the reason I share this is actually that this was pre-Common Core, and so never, never in my life have I realized the need for common standards until I, I began to work across multiple states um, where you would go into a state and ask for them to, you know, use this curriculum, and you would hear reasons like, well, we don't do symmetry in grade three, so we can't implement this because that's a fourth grade concept here. And so there were very isolated reasons that people would give for not being able to, to implement the curriculum um, without really looking at the overall quality and, and what was actually in, in the curriculum content-wise. Uh, so, so the fact that it was based on, you know, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics uh, principles and standards um, didn't didn't necessarily resonate with with all all the states although we did manage to get enough uh, schools and districts across that many states to implement the study but w once the common core came along um, you, you just begin to realize what an important effort it is um, that we, we should be able to pick our our children up and and move to another state and expect that what they were learning in the last state will carry over into the new state um, so it is an important effort, and so I am here uh, trying to help the consortium really figure out what the mathematics needs to look like and what are some of the steps we need to take to, to get it there. Um, one of the biggest questions that we've gotten um, over the past couple of years, and I haven't been in this position that long, but I've been with the consortium because I was with the, the um, Connecticut State Department it is where are the sample items, where are the sample items, where are the sample items. And I think one of the things that people forget is the Common Core State Standards was, was pretty new to everybody, in, including the people who develop items. And so it really takes a lot of training and a lot of um, revision and a lot of support to, to get people to understand what these standards actually say and to think of new ways to measure uh, student understanding of what it is that, that is in the standards. So, so the fact that we didn't have sample items and tasks right out of the gate um, really reflects that this is a learning curve for a lot of people in the country, including those who have been developing items in a certain way for many, many years. Um, next slide, please, Amy. So we began our item development in early 2012, um, or sorry, in early 2012 was when the assessment claims, which I mentioned earlier, those four claims for mathematics were approved. Um, following that, that effort, which is called the Smarter Balance Content Specifications, we developed item specifications, which really 
gave a finer grain size to what was in the content specification. So once we've laid out the claims, we started looking at, well, what are the ways that we can create items that will help us to, to get the evidence we need to determine whether students are achieving what, it, what is in those claims. Um, so, so those documents are all posted online. In, in June 2012, we posted our training modules, which are used to train item writers and reviewers. Um, in, in the item and task specifications, as well as the training modules, we'll go through probably another round of review. Um, they are up for, for public review, and we take all the comments, and we continue to look at whether they're effective. And everything we do is really an iterative process because of the newness of, every, of each um, aspect of our work. Um, in the summer, we began actually writing items, items and tasks, and we also started some work around cognitive labs and small-scale trials. So, um, we, we don't necessarily want to put things out in front of students that have never been tested before, and since some of the things we're doing are, are fairly new, um, we do want to put them out there very early in the process to determine if they're working or to determine which of three different possibilities, for example, might be a better choice in terms of actually measuring the intended construct. So we are wrapping up cognitive lab work, and our small-scale trials actually just kicked off yesterday. And the purpose of the small-scale trials is to begin to analyze whether artificial intelligence can support the scoring of certain item types in mathematics and English language arts. Um, we released this set of sample items uh, last week, I guess it was, October 9th. And in February and March, we will pilot test the first several thousand items and performance tasks um, across Smarter Balance states. So the purpose of the sample items is really to, to begin to look at the rigor and complexity of, of the standards themselves. Um, there, there are a few items actually maybe more than a few items in the mathematics sample that really are intended to, to push the envelope as well, to let the field know that there are certain things that are currently remain unresolved. Um, one of the issues that we face in mathematics that's, that's unique to math is that not everything in math is necessarily neatly placed onto a computer in order to have students respond. Um, so we are analyzing several different response formats up to and including the use of a stylus on a tablet to determine what is the best way to capture student responses to um, items where we want students to show their work and in some cases be able to create a freehand drawing, for example. Um, so we're, we're trying out a whole bunch of different possibilities in terms of response format, but keeping in mind that the end goal is that we have to get the math right. And so if we have to make certain shifts in order for that to happen, then we need to make sure that we continue to push for, for those, those things um, so that we do measure the construct as intended by the standards. Um, the other purpose is to signal some of these shifts in instruction. So I'm actually going to start with an item that I think does a particularly good job of, of looking at some of the shifts that need to happen instructionally and what teachers should be thinking about in terms of, of pedagogy and, and, un, and understanding the standards. And, and we also wanted to look across item types. So we have um, several, several constructed and technology enhanced items. I think only a couple of selected response items in math and uh, one per performance task per grade band. So I'm going to show you several of the features of the system. Um, the way that you can, the way that you can sort of look at the items by a particular category, um, and also what metadata we chose to include with each item, um, knowing that there would be several different stakeholders that would be interested in looking at them. Um, so we know that higher ed is interested in looking, but also we we expect that there will be several parents on looking. So what are the metadata that we should include without overwhelming? Um, some of our stakeholders and generating more questions than we answer. Um, and it's also important to note that if you have feedback on the items um, or if you need support, that, that both of those features are there. There's a link on the landing page that will allow you to provide feedback if you desire, and you can also phone in for support if you're having any issues. Um, it's important to note that these items do not in include the full range of, access of accessibility and accommodations tools that will eventually be available. Um, in, in some cases, they actually 
don't even include all of the uh, tools that would be available for the items. So items that eventually would have a calculator, um, and you'll see a couple of these in high school. The calculator is actually not there currently, and one of the reasons for that is that, like I said before, we're still actually evaluating how students respond to these questions. And so um, based on the evidence that we acquire through the small-scale trials in cognitive labs, we'll begin to revise what those response formats look like and begin to incorporate the tools into the overall system as appropriate. So the, we've gone through a, a phase of rollout on this. We rolled these out to our state leads and chiefs um, the week of the 11th through the 14th. We actually got some, some additional feedback after that particular re preview um, and were able to incorporate a lot of it into the items before the public release, which happened just last week. I think that is this the last slide. Yeah. Okay. So now um, I think Amy would probably prefer to hand the control of the webinar over to me. I will share my desktop. If you want a, a good claim three problem, that's my daughter. She's in the 99th percentile, and every time I go to the doctor and I ask the doctor, well, how do you know it's not the 100th percentile? So I, I um, throw out a little claim three problem for, for my doctor. So let me start with this, um, this grade four item, um, which I said represents one of the instructional shifts that we want we want teachers thinking about um, so I'm going to go up here to about this item. It will tell you the name of the item, which is the contest. Uh, the grade level is grade four. It focuses on claim three, communicating reasoning, although you'll see in this particular item it actually has a little bit of scaffolding built in. Um, it aligns to targets 3B and 2D, which uh, would be a communicating, uh, communicating reasoning target as well as a problem-solving target. And the Common Core State Standards, as you can see, have a, we have a grade three standard listed and also two grade four standards listed. So one of the important shifts that we're trying to signal here is that when students learn something in grade three, it doesn't end there. They need to retain that knowledge into the next grade and have it be useful in what they're learning in fourth grade. Um, the, example, the parallel in ELA I always use is that students learn the sight word the in kindergarten, we don't ask them to stop using it in first grade. And yet in math, there's always been this idea that if something came before, then it's, it's sort of taboo on this year's assessment, and we want to make sure the field knows that that's just not true anymore. Um, so this question basically looks at these, these space creatures are having a contest and asks students how many two-eyed space creatures are needed to make a group with 24 total eyes. And students can either respond with this keyboard or they can respond with the standard keyboard on the, um, that's in front of them. And either will work, but what, what will not work is a button like F or G. So it actually limits the, the, um, the responses that students to give to numeric answers. Um, and if you go down, scroll down on this one, Okay, the last question, somebody told the five-eyed space creatures that they could not join the contest and asked students to explain why five-eyed space creatures cannot make a group with 24 eyes. So it sort of scaffolds the content of, of that students learn in grade three about multiplication and division and looks at what they're learning in grade four, which is, um, you know, they can either use the idea that one thing is not a factor of the other to explain this, or they can use a uh, the division and interpreting the remainder to explain why this is not possible. So there's a couple different fourth grade standards that students can pull on in order to explain why the five-eyed space creatures can't make that group. So up in the navigation, um, you can actually sort the items by technology enhanced items. You can look at just performance tasks. 
you can look at connections across grades. So these are the places where the standards sort of travel across grades, such as the fractions that go from grades 3 through 5, or the expressions and equations work that spans grades 6 through 8. So if I want to look at what these items look like within a particular domain across grades, I can look at this connections across grades tab. And the other thing that's unique to Smarter Balanced is this idea of needing um, items that really span the range of difficulty. So one of the things we wanted to show was how you can take a, a single assessment target and write a couple of items at a couple different levels of difficulty. So if I click on one of these guys with the rectangle, the first item says a rectangle is six feet long and has a perimeter of 20 feet. What is the width of the rectangle? And explain how you solve the problem. And then a second item assessing the exact same um, measurement and data standard and the same assessment targets um, from problem solving has really an, almost an identical question. One of the things we know about item difficulty is that you can, you can increase it quite dramatically simply by um, putting in a number that's not a whole number. And so in this case, we, we use 20 and one third to say this is a more difficult item that assesses the same assessment targets for problem solving as the prior item. But different students would see different items depending on where their adaptive test is taking them. Okay, so let me um, show one more from the early grades and then we can see. So one of the big shifts in the standards is this idea that students understand that fractions are numbers and they exist on this number line. And we want students to be able to understand that really through, throughout the standards with fractions. So this one actually asks them to drag these juice bottles to create a bag that is between six and seven pounds. Um, but it also says that if you can't do that, then, well, leave the bag empty. So. When I add those two guys up, I notice that they're not between six and seven, but actually more than seven, so I'm gonna leave that one empty. Um, so if we should show you the scoring function of these. It's hard to hold a phone and do this. So these items that can be scored automatically, um, if you click the item score function, it will tell you how many points it was worth and what you had to do to get. This one happens to be one point, even though there's, the students are really doing three different things. The reason it's one point is because we're really assessing the same concept with, with the total item. Um, if there were a change in sort of what we were assessing across the different parts of the item, then it would probably be worth two or possibly even three points. Okay, so let's come out of um, elementary and we'll go to a claim one middle school item. Okay, so the number line continues to be important even into the middle school years. We, we want students to understand concepts such as absolute value and even adding and subtracting with integers by understanding what these operations mean in terms of location on the number line. So a student who understands the number line well can actually do this item without performing all the operations because they understand that each of these things is a distance from negative three and a half. Um, so they can actually drag them much more quickly than a student who actually has to sit and calculate everyone and then figure out you know, where they go on the number line. Um, in both cases, students have the ability to get this right but some students will be able to do this one much more efficiently than others. And again, if it's scorable, this one happens to be worth two points um, based on the number of responses that the student has to give. So let me go into high school. Um, so this particular item takes advantage of the technology in a way that I think is, is fairly unique because it asks, asks students to click on tank A to transfer the water to tank B. Um, but they can, they can click it at different heights. So say I'm a student who I, I don't want to have a bare, very big number to work with. I might just remove a little bit of water and notice that the height is 0.81 on the second cylinder, on the, on the cylinder on the right. And so I, I need to use the, in, 
the information about the volume of water that's leaving tank A to figure out the radius of tank B. Um, and again, I can empty the whole thing if I want. So this really assesses students' ability to set up equations and, and understand volume. And it, it does so in a way that it provides multiple approaches just based on the technology. So students will actually set up different equations for, for this particular problem depending on how much water they decide is going to come out of tank A to set, set those equations up. Okay, and if they guessed, they might guess four. And if they guessed four, that would be wrong. So guessing didn't work so well for me. Um, let's see what else in high school can I show you. So this one is, is interesting. This one um, actually draws quite a bit on, on the, you really, the, the standards for it I think are grade eight. Um, but it uses modeling in, in data analysis in such a way that in some cases the content specifications allow that if the mathematics is sophisticated enough that you can um, administer the item at a higher grade level. So this would probably be a grade nine item. We've tagged them in, in this case just by high school, but in our system it would get tagged as grade nine. Um, and the reason I wanna show this one is that it actually allows for different responses based on what the student thinking is. And so um, one of the issues with past assessments and one of the cardinal sins of, of modeling and data analysis really is that the, the correct answer, if you wanna give one correct answer, might be 60 because that's where he makes the most money. And yet, from a practical standpoint, um, there aren't a lot of people out there who would be willing to risk, you know, say 20 bucks to make five more. And so a student could rationalize that spending $60 doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to increase a profit by a very small margin. And so you might choose to spend $40 less on advertising um, just to sort of alleviate that risk factor. So the, if an item does not have a machine scoring currently, then it will have a rubric associated with it. And so the rubric will tell you that any answer that is well supported between 20 and 60, I believe, would actually be considered correct. So students can get credit for full credit for anything between 20 and 60, assuming that they've supported the, um, the choice in such a way that shows that they're mathematical, shows mathematically sound. All right, and so I'll just show one more because I assume that there's some interest in, in the performance tasks. Um, the performance tasks on, on, our, on the web page are currently PDFs. The way they're actually administered will be um, computer-based. But I think in some cases we're actually still working on the technology to score some of these things. So any algebra teacher who sees this title of crickets will, will groan very loudly because in every single algebra book there's inevitably a problem that asks, here's the formula for calculating the temperature and students do one calculation and they figure out what the temperature is based on crickets chirping. And so one of our global things that we want students to understand in high school is that data-based formulas do contain error. And so the fact that algebra books have often presented them as though they're matter of fact rather than, you know, that they do have this source of error, we want students to understand that that's not always true. And if somebody uses a different data set to, to you know, come up with a, a, an equation or a line of best fit, then depending on which data set they use, they might get a slightly different equation. And so we're going for that sort of global understanding in this task, and we do provide students with um, a couple of different data sets to work through. One of the places where we're still working, let me scroll down here. One of the places where we're still working with the technology, and we're actually getting pretty close in, in many cases, particularly for this one, is that you know students are asked to create a scatter plot of, of a particular data set in part A, and then they're asked to do other things with that in subsequent parts. And what we want to be able to do is to give credit for part for number two, even if number one is wrong. And so we're at a point where the technology can handle that. It can handle a little bit of dependency, which will be important for the performance tasks. But 
this one currently has maybe a few more dependencies than, than we're comfortable with in terms of actually putting this online. So we are exploring ways to have um, at least a couple of dependent parts that would that would not um, that would not add a source of error to a student's overall score. So the fact of the matter is we do need a couple of dependent parts to make the performance tasks um, rich, but we don't want to overdo it to a point where we're contributing error to student scores and, and having inferences that maybe aren't so valid. So these are definitely pushing the limit um, in terms of the kinds of tasks that we ask students to complete. Um, each one currently has a classroom activity associated with it, which is an aspect that we will be we have a large research component around this during during the pilot testing phase. Um, and really the purpose of the, the classroom activity is to um, is to level the playing field. So we, we don't want students to get, you know, one, two, and three wrong because they don't know what a chirp is. And so we want to address any things up front that could contribute to construct irrelevant variance in, in the task itself. So the, the activity in the classroom is not about let's teach the kids how to do the math. It's let's make sure the students have the context so that we don't get local dependence issues which would, um, which would lower a student's score simply because they didn't know um, a small important piece of information that shows up throughout the, the actual items that assess student understanding. So I'll ask Jackie if we got any questions that came through. Let's see if we can go back to the webinar screen, Shelby. I'll be able to see what folks have been. Oh, so I need to typing. hand the ball back then. Or Amy can steal the ball back because I'm not sure how to. There we go. Okay. So, folks, I think everybody was watching the sample items, so if there are questions, please type away. And maybe what I'll do while folks are typing is. Um, just let you know, uh, give, give some answers to a few of the questions that came in. Um, the, the easy one was about access to this presentation. Um, a, a recording of this webinar will be placed on the Smarter Balanced website. Um, some of you also asked about access to the guide to different documents. Um, in addition to the sample item tool, which of course is on our website, um, our, our content specifications and item specifications documents are also um, uh, up on the website, so you can access those. Um, uh, somebody asked about access to the assessment for teacher preparation. So the summative assessment is secure for obvious reasons because it's being used for accountability. Um, uh, the sample items, um, in addition to providing some some guideline guidance to um, to teachers, hopefully will also provide some guidance to teacher preparation programs. Um, and it may be possible over time as items are retired that they could be made more broadly available, but you know, we're, we're sort of pedal to the metal to build um, ultimately uh, close to 40,000 items for the um, summative and interim assessments. And so it's not going to be possible to share a lot of those outside of the system because we're going to need them to administer to kids. Um, at least early on, but we hope these sample items and our item specifications and content specifications will be will be helpful. Um, a number of you asked questions about our technology guidelines. Um, there are guidelines up on our website um, for new technology purchases. Um, uh, we are we have been collecting data on the technology that exists currently in schools. Um, and we've been doing this in collaboration with PARC and, um, uh, and we'll be issuing guidelines for existing technology, um, trying simultaneously, and this is a challenge, and, and Shelby's been talking about um, you know, ways that we're trying to push the envelope in terms of, of the use of technology in the system. Um, at the same time, we have to contend with the fact that many um, schools are still using pretty old operating system. Um, and so we're uh, trying to sort of balance that, um, figuring out you know, what we can do. A lot of those animations that you saw, they're pretty simple. And that helps because that's smaller bandwidth. If you put big video files 
that is a lot tougher. So we're thinking about that, those kinds of technology constraints um, in, the, uh, in the design of the items. And to measure the constructs, you don't necessarily always need a super fancy video, Something, sometimes some fairly simple animation that um, doesn't take up a lot of bandwidth can get the job done. So we're really trying to be cognizant of that because we want to both push the envelope but not make the test um, so technologically complex that it's, you know, it, it, it puts an, uh, an unrealistic strain on the capacity of, of the schools. Um, um, and let's see, we've started to get a few more questions coming in, though. So, um, some uh, question of another one more uh, question on technology, which is what will it be required that all students have technology to take the assessment. We will be offering a a, um, a paper and pencil assessment option to states for the first three years. Um, that there will be additional cost to states for the scoring of paper and pencil and secure shipping and all of that. Um, and of course, some of the things that we're doing in um, it won't, it won't be computer adaptive. It'll be fixed form, obviously. Um, and some of the things that we're doing with some of the item types would not be available. But there will be um, this a, a paper-based option um, for the first three years. Um, uh, a question was asked about scoring of performance tasks, Shelby, that maybe you want to take, it, asking um, uh, who will score the performance tasks. Um, uh, do you want to talk about the human and, and AI scoring and how we're sure. thinking about that? So we have um, a relatively small budget for hand scoring of, of items. Uh, most of it is allocated toward the performance tasks, although we do have a subset of items that may be machine selected and still require hand scoring as part of the adaptive test. So a couple of items that may come at the end of the adaptive test, for example, simply to, to fill um, some of the content constraints and make sure that we're doing a good job of assessing the construct. So one of the conversations that's currently happening is where do we get the most bang for our buck? So there are a lot of issues that people are having with third graders, you know, typing mathematical responses into a computer. Um, so it might be the case that we begin to pull some of the hand scoring funding from third grade and move it up into, say, 11th grade, where we want to really make sure that we're, we're giving a precise measure of what students know and can do. Um, there are certain aspects of the performance test that will be uh, machine scored, such as the one I just showed with the scatter plot and the line of best fit, and those types of things can be effectively scored already. But other parts of the performance, if we ask students to, you know, write about a better system for administering speeding tickets, then that's going to take a, a little bit more thought and will re likely require hand scoring. So we do have a budget for hand scoring. Like I said, it, it's fairly small, and so we want to make sure that we, we put it in the places where it's most needed and where we do expect the most rich student responses um, to occur. And so likely we're going to see higher proportions of of hand scoring being necessary um, beyond grade six. One of the things that's always sort of mind-boggling to me is the scale of what we're doing, because we are talking about um, up to 25 states, uh, so uh, 1.2 million students at each grade level. So uh, the, the, the demands for any kind of hand scoring um, are, are the, the practical demands are, are really substantial. Um, we're also cognizant of the fact that, that schools want these data as quickly as they can get them um, because they'd like to integrate the results of the summative assessment into their planning for the subsequent year. Um, and so the more hand scoring we do, obviously, the, the harder it is to turn results around quickly. So um, those are things that we are really um, contending with. And um, Shelby, I want to let you know that I just got the dreaded beep that says my phone battery is dying. So um, Amy, if you wouldn't mind um, showing some of the questions, uh, reading some of the questions to, to Shelby, I'm going to um, dial back in on a phone that's not, that's not dying. <laughs> and I'll be right back.
folks hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Amy, do you have access to the, the questions? Can you read a few for Shelby? She sent one. Um, so the, the question that just came through asks, is Park developing its own assessments or will these be used? And Jackie can probably respond to that one. Um, sure, Park is developing its own assessment, different system. They're, they're going to be a computerized test, but not computer adaptive. Um, so they'll have uh, uh, also looking at the Common Core as the base. Um, but definitely some differences in, in approach between the two consortia. And this gives states a choice, um, a di different approaches, and, and gives states some, some options in terms of picking the, the, uh, the approach that, that works best for them. Um, okay, before I disappear, Shelby, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ring off momentarily and ring right back in on a phone um, that's working properly. Okay, so there's another question that asked if um, when items will include a rubric. Um, typically, the items that have a rubric are the ones that students are explaining something. Uh, so if it asks students to show your work or explain your answer, if it's worth multiple points, then those items typically will include, those items sh should include a rubric. Shelby, are you still there? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, somebody said they noticed DOK was not listed within the sample items. Um, will this information be displayed? So the, the depth of knowledge is being used to sort of inform which items the computer selects. So at the highest level, each student is required to see, for example, a certain number of DOK3 items. So I, the, the test blueprints themselves are not public yet, but eventually they will be. So one of the nice things about the Smarter Balanced uh, Assessment System is that everything we do eventually becomes public. So people will be able to see how many DOK1, 2, 3, and 4 items students are expected to see um, per assessment. Um, and, Jackie, and, it, I'm back. What's the, and one of the reasons we didn't display it with the online items was th this idea that the, the people looking at it are not all at the same level of um, understanding of what depth of knowledge is. So it would have required a whole uh, education of, say, parents and, and different stakeholder groups about what depth of knowledge actually means. And we really wanted to maintain focus on, on the shifts in the standards themselves. Um, I have another question here that says, will the length of time students spend testing increase with the Smarter Balanced Test? That depends on which state that particular question came from. Um, if you're in a st state that uses only multiple choice testing and takes less than 60 minutes per content area, then yes, Smarter Balanced will likely be a, a pretty significant increase in, in testing time because of the types of questions and the performance tasks, which do take multiple um, sessions for a single task. Um, if you're in a state that already does those things, um, then it, it, could, could be a, it could be a decrease in testing time. So that question is actually dependent on where you currently reside. Um, I happen to be in a state where we have pretty significant test lengths because we do a lot of open-ended questions that are expected to take students eight to 10 minutes to respond to. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, will students be able to, uh, put, uh, there's a question here about access. Um, would the summative and interim assessments be available to teachers in higher education? Um, the, sum, this, the formative assessment bank tools would be available. Um, the interim assessment is definitely available to teachers. And the question would be making it available, I guess, to teacher, to higher ed, probably for teacher preparation programs. And honestly, that's something that we haven't really talked about yet. That's an interesting idea um, and certainly something that we could spend some time talking about um, within the consortium, but, but not something that anybody had raised with us, I don't think, uh, to date. A 
did you already answer the question about um, English language learners, Shelby? I don't see it anywhere. Can you? Sure. Um, a question that asked said these assessment questions require much more reading than current approach assessments. How will English language learners fare in this approach? And that's that's a, a great question and something we're grappling with right now. Right. So there are a couple items that um, that I didn't show actually that have short animations to help provide context. So there's one called swimmers and there's one called um, room wall where there's actually a short animation to give students a sense of what's going on in the item. So that's one thing that we're, we're trying out. The other thing that we're looking at during pilot testing, um, Smarter Balanced has supplemental funding for translations for, for its math test. And so we are looking at um, both full translations as well as something that's being referred to as sort of a contextualized or pop-up glossary. Um, so students potentially could be reading an item, come across what would be an unfamiliar term to somebody who d is not proficient in English, and they can actually mouse over and click the word and it will give a translation um, on a word-by-word -word basis based on um, our understanding of which words would be more unfamiliar to students. So we're, we're trying out both of those options during pilot testing. We've done actually a couple of cognitive labs to ensure the functionality of the pop-up glossary. Um, but our translation framework is available on, on the website, um, on the Smarter Bounce website. I believe it was released last week. And if you're interested in understanding some of the things that we will have in place for English language learners, it's certainly worth, uh, worth looking at. This is another example of, of where you know we, we're really trying to reach out to higher education. So one of the things we plan to do um, uh, in November, November is, or December is convene um, a meeting of um, math faculty, um, asking our higher ed leads to to, to uh, tap one person per per state, um, and we'll show some of these items. We'll show some examples of these pop up this pop-up glossary, and really talk about the extent to which uh, the, the faculty are comfortable with this approach, as a uh, whether they see it as in any way um, uh, compromising the, co the, the question of college readiness. Um, uh, so we want to get take that, that feedback into account. Um, uh, there's clearly some benefit to be had. Um, in making sure that, that vocabulary doesn't get in the way of assessing the mathematical content. But we also recognize, of course, that students will be dealing with content in English in college mathematics uh, courses. And so we want to get the, the feedback of faculty on those kinds of questions. So um, an example of, of where in uh, an area in test design where we're trying to, to bring faculty into the process. Um, another question um, was, could you explain when items will include a rubric? If, a, if an item is a, a constructed response, um, I answered that one after oh, on your phone. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. All right. Well, I think that we have. Um, oh, I see. This is a good one. We'll we'll end with this one, Shelby. Um, is there or will there be a list of must know how to skills that kids must know how to do to access the assessment? I'm thinking this has to do with, with use of technology. Yeah, it is, on the use of technology. So would students know how to use a mouse? Would students need to know how to fill in the blank? So yeah, that's a good question. And um, it's something we're exploring to a small degree during cognitive labs in terms of um, which, which formats tend to present, um, tend to students tend to do better on than others. So we're comparing, you know, drag and drop functionality to some other things that sort of assess the same construct to look at which ones students perform better on. And we'll do a little bit of follow up on that with the with the small scale trials. Um, but what we'll try to do is is sort of limit the things that are explicitly new to students that we wouldn't expect them to be able to do based on just their facility with computers. Um, so for example, um, if as the math director, I need grades three through five students to be able to type a fraction into um, an open space, then I would list that as a skill. And 
we, we've agreed sort of informally that probably having only about five of these per grade span would be a good approach. And these would be things that truly fall outside of what the expectations would be um, across the two content areas because English language arts has quite a few 21st century technology computer skills built right into their standards. Great, thank you. Um, well, we've reached the end of our time. I'm sorry that there were a few questions that we that we didn't get to. Um, uh, please feel free to to post those to us via the the Smarter Balance website. We'll be happy to try to to get to them there. Um, and I just really encourage you to to go to smarterbalance.org and 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 uh, play around in the sample item tool and and. Uh, Get yourself familiar with it, and as, as you saw when, when Shelby showed it to you, um, there is an opportunity there to provide your feedback. We would, we would welcome it. Uh, and Shel, um, Amy just put up our, our URL on the screen. Um, and we really just thank all of you for your time and attention. And um, I'm sure some of you are, may have colleagues who weren't able to join us today. We will. Um, uh, put the post this re recording of this session to, on our website. That usually takes us um, a couple of business days to do, so I'd, I'd, I'd encourage folks to look for that um, next week um, at our at smarterbalance.org. So, with that, I want to thank Shelby and, and Amy and all of you for your for your time and your attention. And this concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Thank you.